The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. You can stand if you'd like. You don't have to, but you can. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. Stop there. Where did I stop? Yeah, that was it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. That didn't make any sense at all. You may be seated. I will do my best. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So thinking about that gospel text and what Jesus was saying to his followers, this sort of toward the end uh, of the time um, of his public ministry or the time he's spending with his disciples, his apostles. Um, after this, he's not going to be doing much teaching or many miracles. Really, the focus for him at this point uh, in Jerusalem is what's going to happen at the end of the week as it's recorded there. And that's, of course, his betrayal and his arrest and his crucifixion and, and, and those things as well. He's basically said at this point, I've taught you everything you need to know. Everything you will need to know has been given to you. Um, and implied in that, and, and also referenced in other parts of the Gospels, are you're not going to really understand everything that I'm teaching you until it's over. Until not just when I've been crucified, but when I've been resurrected, and then finally when I ascend into heaven. But it, I'm going to send to you a helper. You're not going to be alone. But trust me when I say to you, you'll get this at some point. It may not make much sense right now, but it will. But sort of theme that, I, that I'm sensing from that passage in Jesus speaking with his disciples. There's obviously a very um, deep sense of, of tenderness and pastoral care for the ones who were following him. Jesus, well, he was a pretty good pastor, I would say. Not bad at preaching and teaching and those miracle things were always wonderful. Wouldn't it be cool if pastors can actually do that? <laughs> Forming miracles. That would be my superpower. Um, but it's very much relational. I mean, obviously, that was one of the points, one of the purposes of Jesus in the Incarnation was to help foster and further the relationship that we have with God. To know God in a human form, not as human, but to make God much more relatable to us. Uh, because prior to that, there was this great sense of fear and trembling and being in the presence of God. It was thought in the Old Testament that nobody could see the face of God or they would die. There was a great fear of that. And when God spoke, uh, either through voice or thunder or however it was that God spoke, the people fell on their faces in great fear. The relationship that God had with his people prior to Christ was a bit tenuous, to say the least. Uh, there was a great deal of, I'm not going to necessarily say misunderstanding or confusion, but the rules of engagement were a lot different prior to Jesus than they are for us today. It wasn't always that way. And, and part of me wonders if maybe it would have been better for this sermon to have the Genesis passage, uh, something from Genesis, bookending with Revelations and the Gospel in the middle. Because if you read the story in Genesis of creation, 
after God had created everything, the heavens and the earth and finally created people, um, there is this deep sense of intimacy and fellowship and relationship between God and Adam and Eve. There was a presence between them. God fellowship with. He dwelled with Adam and Eve in the garden until, of course, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That severed everything, at least in terms of that deep level of intimacy between them, because, of course, we know why. That's the original sin. Not the act of it itself, but the free will being exercised by human people with regard to all that God had promised them and all that God had provided for them in the garden, saying, you have everything you need. There's nothing you are going to lack or want for. It is all here. I've given you everything. What more could you possibly ask for? And the human said, well, we'd like to be like you, because that's what free will does. Uh, and, and that sense of... of Independence that, that, that ego in us that resists being obedient to or under the authority of anything or anyone else reared its ugly head and that created this deep chasm between God and human beings. But God never stopped pursuing the people, never stopped in his efforts to show them kindness and love and made several covenants with them saying, I'm going to in some ways recreate this garden environment, the stain of sin is still going to be there, but I'm going to provide for you, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to guide you and lead you, I'm going to be the light in this crazy world that you all have created by your desire to want to be like me. If God were human at that point of the eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God likely would have said, okay, that's it, I'm done with you, I'm we're not going to keep doing this. Um, but even more, as people disobeyed and disregarded and abandoned and uh, worshipped other gods, certainly nobody among us would ever have the patience like God. Proving over and over and over and over and over and over again that this desire that God has to be in a relationship with human beings is it's unbreakable. It is immovable. It's unstoppable. God will never, ever, ever quit on us. And though we can debate, and many people have, and argue, and wonder, and question, what about all the things that have happened since that time and until now, or even up until the point of Jesus, all of the craziness that's a part of the Old Testament. Those of us who have been gathering on Wednesdays to study, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the questions that come up, well, why did God do that? And how come God didn't do this? And what was wrong with the people and why and I, I don't have answers to all of those questions because I'm not God but in all of it grace is being made known God is extending his grace to people because he never gives up on us and continues to pursue that idea of a relationship with us part of the problem is well everything changed when Christ came to live, to live among us when the incarnation happened and God became one of us. And as I said in my prayer, brought and ushered in the kingdom of heaven with him. And changed the dynamic, not just through the incarnation, not just through his life and his teachings and the things that he did, but because of the cross. Covering up the consequences of our sin. But not only that, taking the weight and the burden of our brokenness onto himself. So that we can have that kind of relationship that he had with God. The level of intimacy, the level of fellowship that is unlike anything we have in this world. He made possible for us. That's the peace that Jesus was talking about. When he says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to leave peace with you. I'm going to leave you my peace peace that he has with the Father. And I define this term every time I speak about it because it's easy for us to think of peace in terms of a lack of conflict or of everything being super great and perfect in our world. Like I'm not upset about anything or anxious about anything or worried about anything or fearful of anything. How many moments like that do you have in your life? 
Not too many. Doesn't happen very often. But that's not what he's talking about. That's not the peace that Jesus is referring to. It's the shalom peace. It's the Hebrew word shalom of the unity between God and human beings. It is the relationship that has been fostered between God and human beings by Christ. It is the unity that Jesus has with the Father. And that's why he references that in that passage of him and the Father being as one. And it's not he who speaks, but the Father speaks. And he's revealing the Father over and over again. Jesus speaks of that relationship. Because what, did, what was missing from Jesus that we have? Sin. Yeah, that's, thank you. That was an easy one, guys. That was a, I just logged that one up there. Was, <laughs> fat, just right in the middle. Mike Trout. Home run. Yeah, it was, it was, I know it's hard to, nobody wants to answer questions in church because just say Jesus, that's, unless it's a question about me. Of course, it's, it's sin. And so that's, I mean, it's way, way more theological and way beyond our understanding try to figure out how God and, and Jesus are connected as one. But the thing that he doesn't have that prevents them from not having that kind of perfect unity, the perfect relationship, the perfect peace, is the fact that Jesus was sinless. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you that same thing. I'm going to give you that same relationship with the Father, but also with me, and leaving you the Holy Spirit to sort of produce all of this. Again, I can't explain all of that and how it works. But if Jesus is saying it, then it has to be true. He doesn't just make stuff up or say things because it sounds awesome. Though he does say things that are awesome. He makes that relationship possible for us. And, and that's the way it's always been for those of us who live in this era of the New Testament, the era post-Jesus, that it's always been that way. I imagine that for the people living in Jesus' day and the ones who were still alive decades after his death, as Paul was writing and as the apostles were teaching and as word was spreading about what Jesus was doing and the, and the struggles they had with not abandoning their religion, Judaism, or their pagan worship, but trying to figure out how this relationship can work because nobody had that kind of a relationship with any God. It was always uncertain. It was always a bit reckless. It was always confusing. And it was never intimate. It was never close. It was never the way it was with Jesus and the Father. And so as they struggled with that, that's a lot of what those teachings about uh, the sacrifice and about the temple and the, and the revelations passage about we're not going to need a temple anymore because God's going to be the light and the temple and the thing that we, that place of worship is, is God. Um, it must have been very, very confusing for them and a hard thing for them to change because that's the way they had always done things. None of us like change, but especially think, well, that's always the way we've done it, so why would we change that? Well, we don't have, we're not in that situation. It's always been that way for us. And so when I say to you that you have this, per, this possibility of having this almost perfect level of intimacy with God, you're going to look at me and, because I think myself, no, that's not possible. It can't be. How can that possibly be? Because I don't always feel that way. I don't always feel that deeply connected with, with God because... I just don't. Well, the truth is, it's not God's fault. It's not necessarily our fault either. The sin that's a part of us is not anything that we did on our own. We can blame Adam and Eve. When we get to heaven, we can all point fingers at them and go, you ruined everything. What are you doing here? Screwed up all. But I think part of the problem is also that we look at our relationship with God or with Jesus in the same way as we define the terms of our relationships with everything else that we have in our world. Human beings, especially. The relationship we have with other humans, regardless of the nature of that relationship, is a give and take from both of us, from both sides. You can't have a friendship or a partnership or a marriage or even a parent and a child, 
or any kind of relationship without expecting something and giving something in that relationship. It's just impossible. You wouldn't have the kind of relationship where you were the only one that was doing things and giving while the other person just basically, that's not a friendship. That's called stalking. <laughs> we don't know. It's totally something different. In our relationships, we do those things. We, we, we do things for the other person in order to build a foundation of a relationship on things like trust, on things like respect, on things like, well, love. Those are the ways in which we show those things. If you say you're going to do something for somebody and you do it, you're building trust and you're building a relationship. What happens if you say you're going to do something and repeatedly over and over again do something completely different? There's, there's not going to be a relationship. It is a two-way avenue or a street. And that's because we each need something from the other person in order to have that kind of relationship. We need something from them, whatever that might be. The problem or the difference between our relationship with other human beings uh, versus our relationship with God is that God doesn't need anything from us. God's desire for us has nothing to do with God lacking anything. He doesn't, God doesn't need the love that we have to give him. God is self-actualized in the truest sense of the phrase. God is God apart from us. God didn't create because he had to. He didn't send his son because he had to. He didn't die on a cross because he had to, because he would be lonely without us, or because God's ego would be terribly bruised if we didn't recognize how awesome God is. God is fully aware of who God is, completely and totally. So God's pursuit of us is just because of the nature of who God is. And God gives and gives and gives and gave and continues to give apart from that need or desire for us to return favor. And so it's not a transactional relationship. It is a fully grace-based relationship from God's perspective to us. But we treat God as if God is sort of human. And we withhold things or we have expectations from God like, why didn't you do this? Or why aren't you doing this? Why is my life so chaotic? And why don't I feel this sense of perfect peace uh, between myself and between you? Well, part of it's because of our brokenness, but part of it is because we just, we don't necessarily invest in that part of our life or our world because God's not standing with us. If Jesus was here today, we'd all be gathered around and hanging out with Jesus, watching him cook fish for us, maybe making some bread, you know, breaking bread, pouring glasses of wine for everybody. What's up, JC? How you doing, man? It's just great to see you. Um, like his disciples had with him, spent all that time with him. So it, there, this distance between us, in a way, it's, it's bridged by the Holy Spirit, but there are things that we can and, and should do that help to bridge that gap and, and bring that, that, close that gap of distance. And it's, it's done by the Spirit and I can't explain it and I, I don't know that I can articulate it that well, but how do you feel when you're sitting in the pews? How do you feel when you come to worship? How do you feel when you leave? Or actually, when you're on your way in, is there a different sense of you when you walk through those doors? Like you've come home, like you're in a place that's different than what exists out in the world. How do you feel when you're praying? How do you feel when you're spending time speaking to God? Not asking God for all the stuff that you want, but speaking to and having that fellowship and intimacy with God. And yes, God sometimes does speak back to us. If you're hearing voices, maybe you want to check with a psychologist, but it's not a voice, it's a sense or a feeling. But how do you feel in that midst? Problems of the world sometimes seem to kind of back up or back away from us. 
the pressure of the world in our life isn't quite the same as it is when we're out doing the things that, frankly, we have to do because this is the world that we live in. God ushered in his kingdom into our world through Christ, but did not kick out the earthly kingdom. And so, as I always say, we're mixing and living in those, in those spaces. When you're reading scripture, is there not a sense of something greater? Is there not a sense of connection in that? Because those words have power. When we're serving others, when we're following in Jesus' footsteps, is there not something that feels different about that? It's really hard to be angry at people when you're praying for them. It's really easy to be angry with people when they've done terrible, hurtful things to you. Don't often have bad thoughts when you're in worship. At least I hope not. <laughs> and I feel like it's because that's where we close that gap and we're in the presence of God and we're feeling and sensing that perfect peace, that intimacy, that fellowship that we have, not just with one another, but with God. And when we step out of that to go do things that we have to do in this life, God doesn't step away from us, but is there. Always. It's just a matter of how often we think about it, how frequently we, we invest in the things of the kingdom, doing the things that Jesus did, following in his footsteps, listening to his commands and his instructions so that we can experience that perfect peace. It doesn't happen necessarily on its own. There are times when it does. It doesn't. But it's not, it's not because God ever pulls back from us or needs anything from us in order to give stuff to us. That's, I mean, that one's written in stone. That's never going to ever change. But how much we want or crave or desire or need that sense of peace in our lives is largely determined by the things that we do and how we live our lives. And one of the devil's tricks is to keep us busy. I don't have time for that. I just don't have time for that. Even you retired people, you're busier than people who have jobs. <laughs> and you have the freedom and the time to spend to say no to this or no to that so I could spend some of my time in the presence of God. But even us working folks, driving to work, Turn on a Christian radio station and listen to praise music. It's much more difficult to be angry at people on the road when you're praising Jesus. Have devotions on a regular basis. Join a Bible study. Come to worship and experience that joy and that peace that can only be experienced in the midst of those spaces that I just mentioned and others. Even just sitting someplace that is peaceful and serene and recognizing that God is the source of that, the beauty of creation, is that in that same sense of the place of worship. Just being aware of it and not defining our relationship with God in the way that we define our relationships with other humans. It's different. It's unique. It is unlike anything this world has to offer to us. Jesus promises us that. It's made possible because of his Holy Spirit. Praise be to God that he has given us that gift. And in this crazy, crazy life, on this side of heaven, we have that place of escape. We have that place where we can go and rest in the Father's arms. We can hang out with Jesus, speak with him and feel his presence and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are loved.